Hello, uh, my name is Mario De Caro. I teach both at the University of Rome, three, and uh, at, at Tufts University in Massachusetts. Um, my uh, goal today is to say something about the relationship between mind, language, and freedom, both considering, considering both um, philosophy and science. Um, let's start from an example that concerns all, all of us all the time. So let's assume that you go to the restaurant and you are asked by the waiter or the waitress, uh, would you like to have risotto or pasta? You think a little, you evaluate it, you know, risotto I had two days ago, pasta was some time ago, but here they probably are better in doing risotto, all these things. And finally, you decide you want risotto. This is a clear case in which you think that you made a rational decision based on your preferences, um, on evaluation. So you were unconstrained, you were free, you knew what you wanted, and so on. Right? Ah, not so much, perhaps. Uh, but in order to understand what I mean here is, <clears throat> it's necessary to go back, to go back five, 400 years for a moment, and to look at one of the greatest philosophers in history, René Descartes. René Descartes uh, proposed uh, a view of the mind that was extremely influential. Uh, let's share the screen. <clears throat> Sorry, it's here. Um, and uh, let's see what Descartes meant. Um, so he had this idea, the famous dualistic idea, right? The on, a dualistic ontology, dualistic realities, two realities, right? The reality of the mind and the reality of the body. Well, the mind for him had a clear primacy because the mind was eternal, was immaterial, whereas the, the body was, you know, mortal, was all the def had all the defects of mother and so on. Uh, this is the cat, right? It looked like a, a, an enemy of Zorro, but was a great philosopher. So he had, he was the protagonist of a great change in the way the philosophy was done. In the antiquity, as you know, the problem was, uh, the investigation started from, from a question. What there is? What is being? What is reality? This is now called ontology, the ontological question. What is out there? What is real? Uh, as you know, the pre-Socratic philosophers looked at nature the way they conceived of nature then, to find what reality is and how it originates. And then Plato saw reality in the world of ideas. And then Aristotle took it back. Reality is this world, uh, the world we perceive, and so on. In the Middle Ages, the, the investigation of reality kept going in a slightly different way, because the main reality was God. So it, it was from there, that invest the investigation of reality had to start. But it was still a real philosophy had to start from the investigation of what is really there, okay? The real reality, so to so say. Well, with Descartes, things changed dramatically because Descartes thought, how can we know what is there, out there, what is real, what is, what is the being, if we don't know how we can know it? So first, we should investigate knowledge how we can know it, what we can know, to up to what point we can know, and so on. This is called, has been called by the famous British philosopher Michael Dummett, the epistemological turn in philosophy, where epistemological means the investigation of knowledge. So Descartes put knowledge at the beginning of the philosophical investigation. The investigation of being on reality came after, okay? That's a great uh, development in the history of philosophy that produces, in his case, some results. But it's still very clear to make an example in Kant, right? The first critique by Kant is exactly a, a critique about what we can know, and especially what metaphysics can know, besides science. Okay, so 
the, there is the most important result for us is what Descartes said about the mind. First, the, the mind is disconnected from the physical world. One thing is matter, another thing is the mind. Uh, our self, our most important nature is to be a mind, a, think, a thinking thing, a mind. We are the thinking thing. We are temporarily connected with the body, but the mind is eternal, the body is not. So we are our mind. The mind is self-enclosed. Everything that is in our mind, we can see it from, from the inside, so to say. Everything else we have to access uh, from the inner to the outside, from the inner to the mind, of the mind to the outside. Everything, the mind is self-enclosed. Third, the mind is transparent to the subject. We, we know what is going on there. Who else could know? And we know it well. You, we know what we want, we know what we believe, we, we know what our intentions are, and so on. Okay, so there are cases in which we are not totally sure, but more or less we, we, we know the mind well. We have a, uh, especially um, ideas that are clear and distinct, very, very, very vivid and clear that cannot be false. We have certain beliefs based on ideas that have to be true all inside our mind. And then we are free because of our mind. You know, we are bodies and bodies cannot be free because bodies obey to the laws of nature. But our will in the mind, that's free. We cannot do everything because we have to go through the body. But as to what we think, we are free. We Freedom is guaranteed by the freedom of the mind. Our own free will is guaranteed by the freedom of the mind. And but Descartes wrote, uh, our free will is one of the most sure ideas we have, the surest idea, ideas we have, cannot be doubted. Finally, the mind is specifically human. Very controversially, uh, he said that only humans have minds. Uh, animals do not. Animals don't really suffer, don't have pain. Pain is a mental state, state but they pretend in some sense. They seem to suffer, they don't, because they are like machines. Machines cannot have a mind. OK, so only humans can have a mind. Well, these five things, some of these five things have been refused very early. So the mind is not disconnected from the physical world. So the uh, dualism, radical dualism of the cult was abandoned very soon. Uh, the mind and world, the body are connected. The mind depends on the body. We couldn't have a mind without the body. First point. And then the last one, specifically human. People soon uh, acknowledge that also animals have minds, but now there is something more. Perhaps besides humans and animals, there are something else can have minds. Machines. I'll, I'll go to the. I'll discuss this point in a few minutes. Okay. The other things, the three things: the self-enclosedness, the transparency, and the freedom of the mind, have been challenged very recently, and we'll talk about that. Okay. So. So let's see what happens after the car. The first thing is important, the so-called linguistic turn. As you know, the car said, we cannot really know what exists, what being is without knowing how we can know it. So knowledge comes before ontology, before the investigation of reality in philosophy. Well, other philosophers between the, the end of the 1800s and the 1900s thought that there is another step to make in philosophy. Uh, in order to know what is real, we have to know what we know and how we know. But in order to know what knowledge is and how we can know, we have to understand what language is, how it works. Because our knowledge, the most important knowledge, is brought to us through language. And I only know that uh, Kabul is the capital of Afghanistan because I use language. I know that uh, 35 plus 9 is 44 through language. Uh, language is the base of our thoughts. Certainly, I don't need language necessarily to learn how to bike, but because this is a knowledge how. But the most important knowledge we have, this is the idea, is the knowledge. No, I know that. I know something that has to be brought to us by language. So 
the language is the beginning of everything, including philosophy. We have to start from an investigation of languages. These are six thinkers that really investigate the language as the beginning. So these are Gottlob Frege, a German philosopher, Bertrand Russell, the famous uh, Nobel Prize uh, philosopher, English philosopher, actually Welsh in origin, I think. Ludwig Wittgenstein, famous, famous uh, um, Austrian philosopher. Then, you know him, uh, de Saussure. De Saussure was a Swiss linguist that really contributed also to philosophy of language. And then Martin Heidegger that famously said uh, that language is the shepherd of being uh, with a, one of his famous metaphors. And then Jacques Derrida, the French philosopher, post-structuralist, post and for which the investigation of language is fundamental. Uh, all these people thought, let's start from language to analyze language and let's see what happens there. And let's see, I, I, I'm interested in a couple of things here. Um, the first is by this famous uh, American philosopher and mathematician, and let me say that a, a dear friend of mine who passed away five years ago, Hilary Patram, externalism and functionalism were two of his most famous uh, proposals. And these are really affecting the way we think of the relationship between language, mind, and the world. Um, so what is externalism? The idea is that the mind is not self-enclosed, as Cartesian, Descartes and the Cartesian tradition have thought, and many people think still now. Uh, famously, Patram said, meanings are not in the head, but then he added, I could have said, thoughts are not in the head. Thoughts are not in the head because the thoughts needs th thoughts need a causal interaction interaction with the world to become meaningful. And he has an example. So the main idea is that what we think has the meaning it has because of our causal inter interactions with the external world. And he has a couple of interesting examples uh, of this uh, semantic externalism. So the way in which our thoughts have meanings. Our concepts, concepts that, you know, compose, the composition of concepts gives us thought. So our thoughts need, need this relationship, cause a relationship with the external world. He has a famous example. Uh, let's go back to 1750. Chemistry is not known yet. And there is a, a person, let's call him uh, Hillary. So Hillary, uh, is in front of a, a little lake and thinks, oh, this is water. He thinks he is in front of a liquid that is transparent, it doesn't taste of anything, and it has no color and so on. It's liquid. Uh, it, it is in 1750, people don't have, didn't have any idea about chemistry, so it couldn't, Hillary in 1750 couldn't understand, couldn't think even, that water was composed of two uh, atoms of hydrogen and one of oxygen. So for them, at that point, water was not H2O, but still, unknowingly to him, Hillary, Hillary in 1750, was contemplating a case of a H2O. Now, Patram asks us to imagine a, another world, a parallel world that is exactly like ours. Everything is the same. There is also another Hillary then in 1750. There is only one def difference. What appears exactly like our water in this twin herd is actually twin water. It's uh, exactly the same from the phenomenological point of view. It looks like the same for us, but it's composed of different atomic, uh, 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 different atoms. So it's composed of two, three elements that we don't even know on the herd. Uh, this is uh, what Patron called them X, Y, Z. So it's not H2O, the liquid there that looks like water. It's X, Y, Z. So it's different. So Hillary and his uh, twin Hillary in the twin herd are contemplating two liquids that look exactly the same, but are different. One is H2O, the other one is X, Y, Z. So Patram says, look, when they say water, they say two different things. 
okay? The meaning of water here and in the parallel twin herd are different. What we think depends on how the world is structured. When I think of water, it's different from what a person in the other twin herd will, will think. They're thinking about different things. This means that our thoughts incorporate the external world as long as they causally, we causally interact with the external world. And this causal interaction makes the meaning of our terms and gives content to our concepts. Okay, so in some sense, the mind is extended over the world. And this is true also in another sense. So, for example, uh, Patna says, I don't know anything about trees, so I confuse very common trees. But I know uh, that there is one that is able to define what a beach is. I know that a beach is a, 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 a tree has some properties. I don't know which ones, but uh, um, an expert in trees, a botanist, would understand, uh, would can tell me what these differences are. So in some sense, my knowledge of trees is in some other, some other people's mind. A lot of knowledge we have is actually somewhere else in other people's minds. And they, our mind goes there to say, so I'm sure that someone knows what the capital of, uh, uh, of uh, Switzerland is. I don't remember it now. Probably, perhaps I didn't even ever know it, but I know someone has it. So I know where to go. I know what, what someone knows about Switzerland. This is part of my knowledge about Switzerland, knowing that someone knows about it. So we know that our concepts refer to the authority of other people. Again, the mind and the concepts that compose our, our thoughts are extending over the world. First idea, the mind is not self-enclosed. You know, when we talk, when we use language, it's essential that we had a previous causal interaction with the world that gives us content to what we think. And then functional is the other great idea of Hilary Patram. He says, look, what is, <coughs> sorry, what is the mind in regard to the brain? Uh, the mind in regard to the brain is what the software is, software is regard in, to the hardware in a computer. Same relationship. The mind is like a program it's not an entity like Descartes thought. It's a program. It's a function. Given some inputs, the mind gives some outputs. The mind is a product of the, the brain, of course. And so the inputs enter and the, the, the mind elaborates these inputs. This means the new neurons work such like in a, the, the, uh, the hardware of the computer works and they produce an output. And the program that says which outputs should correspond to which inputs, this is the mind. It's like a software. <clears throat> this is very relevant. The mind it becomes immaterial, and our mind is like the software of a computer. And this opens the way to the idea that my, um, computers, at least um, very smart machines, can, can uh, be intelligent, understand, okay, have thoughts. <clears throat> Now, Patram also said that eventually that the software is the, the mind and the hardware of our minds is not just the brain, but it's the world. Because as I said, our causal interaction, interaction with the world defines our concepts and the concepts are defined by the software, but the basis is our uh, interaction with the world. So, for example, my concept of water, the mind is elaborated because of my interaction with the H2O. OK, so. Uh, when I see water, I say this is water, and this is working uh, over my brain, but also over the causal relations with the external world. In one, in one, in one, in one word, uh, <clears throat> the mind, the software, uh, go over the physical world that includes my brain, but also the external world. This is the mind. Okay, is open to toward the world. It's not inside, it's not self-enclosed, even when it is conceived as a software. Okay, this has some consequences. Uh, how people, philosophers and psychologists, most of them, at least the most updated philosophers, there are philosophers that still use, you know, think about uh, uh, philosophy is still at the time of Aristotle, great mind, but we have gone forward. So the mind is is not disconnected from the physical world, as we said, first point. Um, I'm saying that all the uh, Descartes' ideas 
are false. It's not self-enclosed, as I just said, because he, uh, the, the, our thoughts, that it was the mind does, are defined, but they are causal interaction, interactions with the external world. Now, two more points, three more points. The mind is not very transparent to the subject, Alice, we'll see. That's a, a sad thing to say. It's not, we, the mind is not, not as free as we would like to think. And many people think that freedom doesn't exist at all. Uh, it's not specifically human. It's not specifically human because not just animals, but also machines can have minds. So this point we'll cover in a few minutes. The first is a desperate attempt and very brilliant attempt by the philosopher John Searle to say, no, 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 the mind is internal to the, to the, um, to the, 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 brain, the head. It's not true that we have a, this causal interaction with the external world. Uh, uh, minds cannot be, uh, cannot be uh, intelligent and so on. So this is the most authoritative uh, attempt to be, to retain what is still possible of Cartesianism. Certainly it's not a dualist in Cartesian sense, in the Cartesian sense, because he thinks the mind needs a, bo a body, a brain, but he is not externalist. He doesn't think that our meanings depend on the causal interactions of the world and thinks that machines cannot ever be very intelligent. Uh, here are, and then we'll go back to the experiment that proves that in his opinion, his ideas. He is against strong AI, it is impossible, strong AI, is the idea that machines are intelligent in the way we are, and perhaps more. He thinks this is impossible. Not just false now, this we can grant, it's impossible in principle. Second, function is the idea that Patnam had, that the mind is like the software, and the brain and external world are like the, the hardware. It's not true. The mind is not a software, so the computer that has a software cannot have a mind. And then famously denies the famous Turing test. What is the Turing test? Turing test is a way of supposedly, allegedly, understand what, if, whether a machine is intelligent or not. Um, Turing is the famous British uh, logical, um, logic and uh, uh, mathematicians and philosopher who, who did great contributions to artificial intelligence, the beginning of artificial intelligence and computer science. But also propose this Turing test. The idea is very simple. You put in two different rooms, closed rooms, one computer, smart computer, allegedly, that can interact with language with us, and a person. And then a jury asks questions to both without knowing who is where. Okay, if by, understand, by asking many questions and getting many answers by both the computer and the person, you are not able to say who is who, where the computer is. This means that the Turing test has passed. The computer has proved to be intelligent. For sure, that's not true. This is not what happens. Even if a computer passes past the Turing test, it wouldn't be intelligent at all. Why? Well, let's go back to his famous Chinese room experiment. This is the one in the, uh, in the uh, right side here. So, this is the idea. This is John Searle himself, who does not understand Chinese, nothing. And he's here, and he has this handbook that is kind of uh, uh, translated, it is written in English, and it says how to make um, a correspondence between uh, questions written in Chinese and answers written in Chinese. So he gets, from this person here, sort of gets questions, he doesn't understand what they mean, but he has this uh, big book where he can find what answers he should write in a, in a, a little paper, okay, and send it back without knowing at all what he's uh, doing. He knows that there are questions coming and he knows that there are answers going out, but he doesn't know what they are about. He only copies uh, symbols. As Sir says, this is only syntax. They the, I'm not able to understand. I don't go to the level of semantics, okay? I only manipulate symbols, exactly like computers. I manipulate symbols. I don't understand what is, uh, what is going on there, right? We, we should agree that he doesn't understand Chinese before entering in the room, and he doesn't understand it after, because he never understood what he was doing. He was only putting 
in couples, questions with answers without knowing what they were about. The person outside, however, would think that, oh, Sirla understands Chinese. He gets good answers every time, right? He perfectly understands Chinese. And this is like the uh, Turing test, Sirla says, right? Because people have good answers and judge, okay, that person understands Chinese. He says, no, I don't understand Chinese. Okay, I don't understand the meanings. I don't understand the semantics here. Exactly like computers. I am like the CPU of a computer that, you know, manipulates symbols. It's only at the syntactic level, but never understand the meanings, the semantics. So I can't understand what I'm doing. The computer cannot ever understand what they are doing, even if they seem to understand. So the idea is this. Uh, never, never computers will be able to understand because understanding is a biological property. I can understand because I have a human mind and I understand meanings. Computers can't because they only manipulate strings of zero and ones, right? Zeros and ones. That's what they do. They don't understand what they we are asking them. How could they be said to understand? So first, let's go back here. Uh, Net computers won't ever understand what they are doing. So we cannot call them intelligent in the strong sense of strong AI. Weak AI says, okay, they are good at doing things, but strong AI says more, they are really intelligent. No, they are not because they miss, necessarily miss, lack forever, um, a fundamental component of intelligence that is understanding of what you're doing. So strong AI is impossible. The mind is not a software because the software doesn't understand ever what it is doing. The mind is something more because the mind doesn't only manipulate symbols. It only understands meanings. And third, the Turing test cannot evaluate real intelligence because he only evaluates the products, but not the ways this product are generated. The, the Turing test cannot tell us if the computer can understand or not. And we know it can't because he only manipulates symbols. Okay, this seems true. So at least we are I preserved a space for, if it's certainly correct, for this our being special, right? We only us and perhaps some animals can understand something, but machines won't ever understand that. Perhaps one point of uh, uh, Cartesianism is saved. According to many people, however, this uh, the Chinese room ex thought experiment, if brilliant, is wrong. Most of the people don't agree with Sir. Let's see for three main reasons. The first is this. Uh, how do we attribute minds to other people? So I see someone who comes and tells me something. It says, oh, do you want to go to the movie or something tonight? I understand. I, how do we know that this person has a mind? We cannot enter in their own uh, uh, school and see what happens there if they really understand the meanings. We only judge uh, that uh, that an entity, that person has a mind from what they do, right? Uh, lo look, um, let's take a, 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 a movie like Blade Runner in which you don't know if you are uh, interacting with a machine or with a human, with a replicant or with a human. Um, how do you know, right? In the machine, in the in the in the in the movie, they have strange ways of understanding. But the real experiment is how to enter in the machines and the minds. Only the person there know what is happening if they understand or not, right? That's the idea. Uh, we cannot enter there, so we judge, we attribute minds to people who behave in in, in ways that we judge intelligence. Period. Why should we use a different standards for machines? That's a question, right? It seems unfair. We have a person and we say, okay, this person totally understand. And then someone says, no, look, this is a robot. But I, so I should say, no, it doesn't understand. The question is why? You are begging the question here. You are saying machines are not like humans. And then when you find that that thing that you thought was understanding perfectly, and you know that is a machine, you say at that point, no, it's not, it doesn't understand. Why? Well, this seems to really, um, seems really a, a petitio principi, as philosophers say. So you are begging the question. Second point, how do children learn to understand? Uh, that's important because children come to life without knowing uh, symbols, right? 
they don't know what is uh, uh, what is uh, the meaning of pen or the meaning of uh, computer or the meaning of uh, freedom, right? They don't know anything about this. That's clear. Um, they learn. They learn, or learn by interacting with the world. So they pick a pen, an adult say pen, and they say pen. And every time they say a pen, they will say pen. They know that this is a pen. This is the way they understand. They don't know at the beginning, but they learn by interacting with the world. And why shouldn't the same be possible for machines? Let's assume a little robot that goes around. There are these machines, right? And learn to um, concept, to apply concepts to reality. They take a pen and they will say pen and they know that this is a pen. When they see another pen, they will say pen. It seems that really uh, this is the way it goes. You learn to understand meanings, right? To use meanings correctly and so on. It's a process. It's not that it's you children, human children are born with this capacity. So why shouldn't also machines be able to learn that? Third point. This is the most famous reply, the system reply. How could you, uh, how could you um, think that uh, the computer, the Chinese room, uh, sorry, I would say, right? The, the, I am in the Chinese room. How could you say that I understand? People say, yes, you do not understand, but you are not the entire system. The system involves you, and the manual there, the book that gives you instructions. Together, this system do, does understand English, right? Exactly like it's not the computer, the CPU that understands, it's the old system, the software, okay? The software that runs on the, on the, with the CPU, but it's the old software that gives you good answers. This is uh, something that uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein had very clear. He said, how do I know that people uh, can do multiplications. It's not that they have a, you know, a light in their uh, mind saying, oh, I know how to do them. Because they could have the light and not understand at all how you do multiplications. And vice versa, they can do multiplications correctly and have no light. They just do, they could even think that they are not able to, but they do it correctly. And finally, they will, finally, they will understand that they understand multiplications. The point is this, is not what is, you know, your sensations, feelings, or intuitions about whether you understand or not, but what you do that defines if you have understood. The entire system, software of your mind that says if you have understood, right? Uh, so the system of Searle with the manual can be said to understand Chinese because it gives always correct replies. And if you understand how to do multi multiplication, this is something that is only established by looking at how you do multiplication. So machines can do that. Machine can actually give good performances. So this is the idea. Uh, machines can understand what they do exactly how we can understand what we do. So perhaps Searle is wrong. Perhaps machines in principle, we don't know if it can be done in fact, will be able to become intelligent in the sense of strong AI. Okay, now the last thing that is left to us is freedom. We have freedom, machines don't have freedom. And I want only to hint something to you here. Uh, this is a famous experiment the, uh, by this guy, Peter Johansson. When they get the, the car, they don't recognize in most cases what the, the car has been changed, but they invent an explanation of why they made the choice that they didn't actually make. And notice that what is important here is that um, uh, they don't make any, there is no difference but when they explain the choices they have actually made and the choices that they didn't make. They explain exactly in the same way with the, there are no physiological differences, no brain differences, everything, everything is the same. So what um, Johansson thinks that, is that people actually make up stories all the time about what they did. They make confabulations, as he said. Um, they uh, try to make sense of what the choices they made to give uh, the idea to the others, but also to themselves, that they control what they did, okay? 
they knew what they were doing. And uh, actually, uh, Johansson thinks that our choices are blind. We don't know why we choose. In this sense, our freedom would be very much compromised. Now, I think that it's not true that this is true all the time. If we are very focused and we talk about, think deeply about our choices, I think that our conscious mind can still be effective causally and decide what we do. This is our space of freedom, but still there's freedom of our mind, but still it's not as big as we thought. There are many uh, uh, ways of exploiting these tendencies of, our, of ours now. Think about neuromarketing, neuropolitics, neuroeconomics. So all these attempts to uh, take advantage of the fact that we don't pay attention to what we are doing. We are not really using free will. We go unconscious, we decide unconsciously for reasons we don't know. So there is a little space of freedom. This is the last heritage of Cartesianism. But it is up to us how little it can be. We can be careful. We can, when we make choices, we should be careful. We should know that sometimes we decide without realizing that unconscious motives really bring up our decisions. We should be careful with that. We should pay attention, consider all the alternatives and what we really care about. So we have a little freedom, but this little freedom is very precious. Let's keep it uh, really alive as much as we can. Thank you very much.